Good morning, YouTubers. My name is Nubia. I am in recovery. I am reading out of the Life Recovery Bible, all the way from Anoka, Minnesota. Today, we are continuing in the book of Mark, chapter 8. About this, uh, Jesus feeds 4,000. Father God, thank you for this amazing, wonderful, unbelievable day in the end of January. I am, we're so grateful. We know you love us. I am, please allow me to read clearly and slowly, to speak clearly and slowly, and to think clearly and slowly so I can clearly relay your message. Thank you. Amen. And I am a little tilted over here. I don't want to move too much. I don't want the phone to move so much. So we're gonna go like this. Yeah. I need to get my footstool because I have a footstool. And maybe Big Boy or Spooky decide to show. Spooky's not gonna show because I just gave her a really good squeeze in a bad way because she's still hissing at Nena for no, no reason, just because she, she doesn't hiss a big boy, she hisses at Nena. All right, chapter eight, Jesus feeds the, the four, feeds 4,000, yeah. About this time, another large crowd had gathered, had gathered. I gotta take a breath. And the people ran out of food again. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been here with me for three days and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint along the way. For some of them, they have come a long distance. His disciples replied, how are we supposed to feed, to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? Seven loaves, they replied. So Jesus told all the people to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves, thanked God for them and broke them into pieces. He gave them to his disciples who distributed the bread to the crowd. A few small fish were found too, so Jesus also blessed this and taught the disciples to distribute them. They ate as much as they wanted. Afterwards, afterward, the disciples picked up seven large baskets of leftover food. There were about 4,000 men in the crowd that day, and Jesus sent them home after they had eaten. Immediately after this, he got into a boat with his disciples and crossed over to the region of Dalmanutha. Pharisees demand a miraculous sign. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him, testing him. They demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. When he heard this, he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why do these people keep damaging mirac demanding miraculous signs? A miraculous sign I tell you the truth I will not give this generation any such sign so he got back into the boat and left them and he crossed to the other side of the lake yeast hmm. of the Pharisees at Herod but the disciples have forgotten to bring any food they had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat as they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, watch out, beware of the gist of the Pharisees and of Herod. At this, 
they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. Jesus knew that what they were saying, so he said, What are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? Your eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? When I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of leftovers did you pick up afterwards? Afterward, 12, they said. And then I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves. How many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven, they said. Don't you understand yet? He asked them. Jesus heals a blind man. When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought to blind, some people brought a blind man to Jesus, and they begged them to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out, led him out of the village. Then, spitting on this man on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, "Can you see anything now?" The man looked around. Yes, he said, "I see people." But I can't see them very clearly. They took like they look like little trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were open. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. Jesus sent them away, saying, Don't go back into the village on your way home. Peter's declaration about Jesus. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea. Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do we, who people say I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you think I am? Peter replied, You are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus predicts his, his death. should have brought a hat. I'm gonna go get a hat. Hold on. I'll be right back. Better. Peter replied, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus predicts his death. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about his, this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. I need to go get my, my notes, my notebook. It's so nice out here. Yeah, I'm gonna go get my notebook. 
so I can take notes. I'll be right back. I'm back. Thank you for waiting. Yeah, I gotta write this down. Eight thirty three. There he is. Get away from me, Satan. He said, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then calling, then calling the crowd to join his then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang onto your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world to lose your own soul? Is nothing worth more than your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, in these adulterous and sin in these adulterous and sinful ways, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is Cabo's pumps. Good note. We sometimes feel like our prayers never get beyond the ceiling. We wonder if the hot line or to God is busy and if we have been left indefinitely on hold. The truth is God is never too busy to concern himself with the daily needs of his people. Jesus was moved by pity to feed 4,000 hung hungry people, even though he was busy with a preaching and healing campaign. There is no need too small or request too large that God will not hear and respond to. Jesus was troubled by his disciple lack of faith and their seem, seeming inability to learn the basic lessons he was trying to teach them and slow to catch on as they were Jesus still nurtured them in faith. We need tend to progress we may tend to progress in recovery in a series of lurches lurches and falls when we fail we can recover by quickly admitting our limitations accepting God's forgiveness and continuing to depend on his power I'm gonna say it again I'm gonna read that again when we fail we can recover by quickly admitting our limitations accepting God's forgiveness and continuing to depend on his power day by day. God will be patient with us if we are willing to stick with his program for recovery. When Jesus told his disciples that his ministry would lead to suffering and death, he was sharing a basic truth about life. When we are dealing with the destructive effects of sin, victory usually comes only after pain and tears. No cross, no resurrection, no pain, no gain. Jesus had to suffer in order to overcome the destructive power of sin in our world. Recovery from our destructive habits will also involve pain. But we should not let this discourage us. Jesus has already paid the price for our sins. If we confess our sins and accept God's forgiveness, we can be sure of victory over our addictions with God's daily help. Chapter 9 Jesus went on to say, I'll tell you the truth. 
some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. The Transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his cloth became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking to Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, but they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshouted them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back into them, as they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. Then they asked him, What do you teach? Why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet, why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they chose to abuse him, just as the scriptures predicted. Jesus still heals a demon-possessed boy. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son to you who I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever his, this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently, violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, he threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, breathing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked to the boy's, boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked, anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of unlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left, and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. 
A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet. And he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with the disciples, they asked him, Why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, This kind can be cast out only by prayer. Jesus again predicts his death. Leaving that region, they traveled through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know he was there, for he wanted to spend more time with his disciples and teach them. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed. But three days later, he will, be, he will rise from the dead. They didn't understand what he was saying, however, and they were afraid to ask him what he meant. The greatest in the kingdom. After they arrived at Capernaum and settled in the house, Jesus asked his disciples, What are you discussing out? What were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer because they had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. He sat down called the twelve disciples over to him and said, Whoever wants to be first must take last place in the servant of everyone else and be servant to everyone else. Whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone, everyone else. Then he put a little child among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Anyone who becomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also the Father who sent me. Using the name of Jesus, John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw something someone using your name to cast out demons but we told him to stop because he wasn't in our group don't stop him jesus said no one who performs a miracle in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me anyone who is not against us is for us if anyone who gives us if anyone gives you even a cup of water because you belong to the Messiah, I tell you the truth, that person will surely be rewarded. But if you cause one of these little ones to trust, who trust in me to fall into sin, it will be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. If your hands causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one foot than to be thrown into hell with two feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, couch it out. It's better to enter the kingdom of God only with only one eye than to have two eyes and then be thrown into hell, where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. For everyone will be tested with fire. Salt is good for seasoning. But if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? You must have the qualities of salt among yourself and live in peace with each other. Wow. Wow.
for not. Though on a soft examination, the father of the demon possessed boy acknowledged both belief and doubt. He believed that Jesus could restore his son to death, but he questioned whether Jesus would do so. Sometimes we feel the same way. We see how God has delivered others and believe that God can help, but we fear that he will refuse to help us. Perhaps we are afraid that God will think of us unworthy of his deliverance. God never works that way. Not only is he able to help us, but he's also, but he also wants to help us. He's able to help us, but he also wants to help us. We must turn to him in faith, ask for his help and forgiveness, and follow his revealed will for us. God will do the rest. Can I write something down here? The argument over who was the greatest in God's kingdom ran counter for everything Jesus stood for. True greatness is measured by how we serve others. That service for the disciples, including showing love for all people, even a little child. We may not be tempted to turn away from need, needy children, but what about the many adults who need our help? Do we turn away people who are poor, homeless, hungry, or addicted? God heals our hurts so we can help others get the healing they need, not so we can rise to a higher position in society. If we fail to help needy people, we are pushing Jesus right out of our lives. Cooperation and peace, not cutthroat competition, must characterize our personal relationships. Jesus instructed his disciples to fully and peacefully accept others who ministered in his name. He approved of those who were building up the kingdom of God, even if they were not part of his core group of disciples. So we, so must we. If we fail to do so and cause others to lose their faith, we will suffer the painful consequences. Cooperation and peace, not cutthroat competition. There's a lot of cardinals over there. No, I'm not gonna touch it. Yeah, maybe you can see it. One here, right there.
Okay, that's enough. Yes, that's what we're reading. We're not bird washing. Correct? Correct. Through a series of star startling statements, Jesus admonished his disciples to get rid of anything in their lives that might draw them away from God. For us, this could refer to our besetting addictions and the emotional baggage that supports them. We can identify our weaknesses by making an honest moral inventory of our lives and then take action to cut off our offensive, par our offensive parts so we can begin the process of healing. It is usually wise to have the help of a support group as we follow through on such drastic measures. Chapter 10. Discussion about divorce and marriage. Then Jesus left Capernaum and went down to the region of Judea and into the area east of the Jordan River. Once again, crowds gathered around him, and as usual, he was teaching them. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them with a question. What did Moses say in the law about divorce? Well, he permitted it. They replied, he said a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. But Jesus responded, he wrote this commandment only as a concession to your hand, to your hard hearts. But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since there are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Seven to nine. Later, when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again. He told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her and if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else she commits adultery jesus blesses the children one day some parents brought their children to jesus so he could touch and bless them but the disciples called the parents for bothering him when jesus saw that jesus saw what was happening he was angry with his disciples he said to them let the children come to me don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands over their heads and blessed them. That's one of my favorite verses. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. The rich man. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, 
you know the commandments. Oh, I'm gonna write that out. Wow. <clears throat> but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, you must not cheat anyone, honor your father and mother. Fisher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine, love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told them. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will, leave, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's fell, face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed them. But Jesus said, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of, ha of God. This, let me write this. So, eighteen to. The disciples were astounded. Then, who in the world can be saved? They asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, "Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God." Then Peter began to speak up. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. Jesus replied, yes, Jesus, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for this good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution. <laughs> And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then. And those who seem least important now will be greatest important then. Jesus again predicts his death. They were now on the way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people following behind them behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the twelve disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They would sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They would mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Jesus teaches about serving others. <clears throat> then James and John, I'll tell you what, I don't know what the temperature is, I don't, it's okay temperature is in the 40s it's gonna get to 54 Jesus teaches about serving others then James and John's the son of Zebedee came over and spoke to him teacher they said we want you to do us a favor 
What is your request? He asked. He re they replied, When you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in the places of honor next to you, one on your right hand, one on your right, and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh yes, they reply, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with the baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rules in this world lorded, lorded over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to serve but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Wow. Um. Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus, 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 Bartimaeus. Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind men, cheer up, they said, come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. For note. Actually, we're going to read the 12-step devotional, step one, like little children. Bible reading, Mark 10. We admitted that we were powerless over our problems, that our life had become unmanageable. For many of us in recovery, memories of childhood are full of terrors associated with being powerless. If we were raised in a family that was out of control, where we were neglected, abused, or exposed to domestic violence and dysfunctional behavior, the thought of being powerless might be very frightening. We may have silently bowed, vowed never again to be as vulnerable as we were when we were children. Jesus tells us that in order to enter the kingdom of God, we must become like little children. And this involves being powerless. He said, I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. 
In a society, children are the most dependent members. They have to inherit power for self-protection. No means to ensure that their lives will be safe, comfortable, or fulfilling. Little children are singularly reliant on the love, care, and nurture of adults for their most basic needs. They must trust their lives to someone who is more powerful than they are. Although they may not know, they may not know exactly what they need, they must cry out to obtain it. And hopefully they will be heard and lovingly cared for. We too must admit that we are truly powerless over our lives. We are truly powerless if our lives are ever to become healthy. This doesn't mean we, be, we have to become victims again. Admitting our powerlessness is an honest acknowledgement of our situation in life and a positive step toward recovery. The Pharisees were not looking for guidance. When they asked Jesus about divorce, they were looking for means to strap him. Jesus offered no grounds for divorce, with the possible exception of adultery. Today, many believe divorce is a good way to deal with conflict. Most of us have discovered, however, that interpersonal conflicts follow us wherever we go because, they're only, because they are only evidence of much deeper problems. The same problems may also drive our dependencies. May also drive our dependencies. Marriage is not always easy. Neither, neither is recovery. But both can be of great help to us. Marriage gives us a context of accountability and loving support to help us through recovery. Recovery gives us the program for personal growth and reestablishing our families and marriage relationships. Most people in Jesus' day believe that wealth was a reward from God for being good. Thus the wealthy usually enjoyed a measure of prestige. Jesus amazed his audience by showing how very difficult it was to be rich to enter God's kingdom. Healthy people have a hard time recognizing their need for anything. And the only way to receive God's help is by recognizing how much we need. The rich young man needed to see his helplessness before he could be helped but even his problem this problem is not big for god he gets the attention of even the proud and self-sufficient many of us have learned through painful experiences that we are helpless and need god's intervention in our lives god often let us hit bottom so we can begin to experience his healing and forgiveness Faith brought sight to blindness. Faith brought sight to blind Bartimaeus. He preserved in faith despite the initial opposition he experienced from the crowd following Jesus. In Jesus' day, Jesus' day, blindness was often considered a divine curse for sin. But Jesus refuted this notion by both word and deed. We sometimes face opposition in our recovery process. Sometimes those who claim to be God's people reject us and make us feel unwelcome because we are trapped in our dependencies. Even when others reject us, we can be sure that Jesus will never turn us away. We should persevere like Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, like Bartimaeus did, knowing that Jesus has the power and the desire to help us overcome our weaknesses.
chapter 11 Jesus triumphant entry as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem they came to the towns of Bethphage 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 and Bethany on the Mount of Olives Jesus sent two of, me, two of them on ahead going to that village over there he told them as soon as you enter you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever written untie it and bring it here if anyone asks what are you doing just say the Lord needs it and will return it soon the two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street tied outside the front door as they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, What are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. They had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession procession and the people all around him were shouting praise God blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David praise God in in highest heaven so Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple after and went into the temple after looking around carefully at everything he left because he was late in the it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the twelve disciples. Jesus curses the fig tree. The next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in, in full leaf, a little ways off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, May no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. Jesus clears the temple. Hmm. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayers for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. The evening Jesus and the that evening, Jesus and the disciples left the city. The next morning, as they passed by the fig tree, he had cursed, the disciples noticed he had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered that Jesus, what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it. You must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I'll tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that, will if you believe that, I'll tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you can that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too.
the authority of Jesus challenged. Again, they entered Jerusalem. As Jesus was walking through the temple area, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders came up to him. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right to do them? I tell you by what authority I do these things if you answer one question. Jesus replied, did John's authority to baptize came, come from heaven or was it merely human? Answer me. They talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he will ask why we didn't believe John. But do we dare say it was merely human? For they were afraid of what the people would do because everyone believed that John was a prophet. So they finally replied, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. Footnote. As we suffer the pain of our addictions, we often look for instant relief. We wish someone would come and sweep all of our problems away. The Judeans were expecting the same kind of deliverance from their Messiah. They wanted a glorious political king to ride into Jerusalem and sweep the Romans out of power. Instead, Jesus came riding on a lowly donkey in peace. God does not offer instant, instant cures. He works our recovery through a process of personal growth from the inside out. He helps us recognize our sins and our need for help and he gives us the strength to take the necessary step toward recovery. The barren fig tree is analogous, is an, an is analogous, analogous, yeah, to people without spiritual fruit. Even though the fig tree appeared healthy, if it didn't produce fruit, it was designed to do, as it was designed to do, then it had no real reason to exist. If the temple did not produce true worship and prayer, but only ill-gotten gain for the money changers, then the temple had to be judged and cleansed. It is similar for us in recovery. If our lives in recovery are not bearing the fruit of their behavior patterns, then we need to imagine ourselves and consider if our faith is sincere. If we are only going through the motions, then our attempts at recovery are worthless. God wants us to pray for his will to be done in our lives. As much as we want us, as much as he wants us to pray for fruitfulness, fruitfulness and, king, and his kingdom work. It is God's will, however, to remove mountains of resistance or denial from our lives. God has the power to do miracles, but not if we doubt him. The God of the kingdom and of recovery is the God of the impossible. If we want God to work a miracle of healing in our lives, we must pray and believe that he will. We need to admit our helplessness and, pass and put our lives into God's hands. He will then walk with us as we face each new step in recovery. I am going to leave it at that for now. I need to take a break because my mouth is dry. Yeah, 22 and 25. Yep. All right. So, thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And I hope you all have a wonderful and blessed rest of your day. Many peace, love, and blessings.